just gone three o'clock here in London, a slightly overcast London, looking out my window. Um, welcome to everyone to this second in the Sophian series um, of webinars on automated patch clamp in academia. Um, I'm going to be your host, but we've got two great speakers for you today. We'll be talking primarily in iron channels and oncology and emerging field. And uh, this is going to be our today's agenda for the webinar. So my esteemed colleague, uh, Naya Sorensen, an application scientist at Sofian, is going to give you a brief overview of iron channels and, uh, and oncology, uh, followed by uh, Professor Amir Ahmed of uh, King's College London, who will be talking about wind signaling in cancer. Um, and with that, I'll hand you over to uh, Naya, who will take you through the first of the um, the initial introductory slides. Over to you, Naya. Well, hello everyone. My name is Naya and I'm an application scientist at Sophia and Bioscience and I have been there for more than a decade. Um, I will give you a brief introduction to uh, iron channels and oncology before Professor Amia is on. Uh, so here we go. Over the last two decades, the importance of ion channels in cellular physiology and cellular pathophysiology, where these processes are hijacked in cancer, have been defined. Don't worry, <laughs> I don't expect you to read all the details on this slide, but these tables highlight the vast array of ion channels and their critical role in normal and abnormal cellular processes that drives the development and maintenance of multiple cancers. I'm sure you can all pick out your own favorite iron channel here, whether it would be a potassium channel, sodium channel, trip channel, uh, amongst this extensive list. Over the next few slides, I will describe some of the hallmarks of cancer and some of the iron channels implicated in the cellular processes. This figure is an overview of the hallmarks of cancer and the ion channel families involved in each process. Each of these processes are where the usual cell characteristics and processes are overridden and become aberrant or abnormal in the activity. And I'll ease, uh, briefly define each of these in turn. Going clockwise on the top of the figure, the first hallmark of cancer is self-sufficiency in growth signals. In other words, how cancer cells generate and maintain their own growth cycles by making and secreting cell division and growth signals. The second hallmark of cancer is insensitivity to anti-growth signals. Uh, the usual checks and balances uh, that in cell tissues like a contact pressure inhibition are lost or overwritten in cancer, allowing cancer to grow and develop uncontrollably. Tissue invasion and metastasis is the third hallmark of cancer. The ability of cancer cells to invade tissues and metastasize uh, or the increased mobility to or the increased mobility to move to other tissues usually checks and balances in those cell tissues like con again contact and uh, pressure inhibition are lost or overridden in cancer allowing cancer to grow and develop uncontrollably. Moving to number four on our list of hallmarks of cancer is the limitless replicative potential. One of the key elements that we all associate with cancer is immortality or the ability of cancer cells to replicate numerous times without the usual lifespans or cell division cycle stop signals. Oh, sorry. I may have moved a little too slow. So we're going on to the cancerous tumors need their own nutrients and oxygen supply whilst removing metabolism waste products like CO2. 
sustained angiogenesis is the fifth hallmark of cancer uh, and it generates blood vessels to supply energy and remove aspects of respiration that tumors need to sustain their growth and replication. Finally, the sixth hallmark of cancer is evading apoptosis as part of the aspect of cancer cell immortality, which complements the limitless replicative potential described earlier. Is the ability to avoid programmed cell death and apoptosis. So one of also the more important factors. Vint proteins are, oh, sorry, I'm moving on too fast. TRIP signals regulation of intracellular calcium activated, or intracellular calcium is associated with the hallmarks of cancer pathophysiology, including enhanced proliferation, survival and invasion of cancer cells. These findings indicate that uh, TRIP channels affect multiple events that control cellular fate and play a key role in cancer progression. However, the interactions between ion channels and cancer-related signaling pathways are poorly understood so far. Nevertheless, a limited number of reports have recently addressed the important issue, especially regarding the interaction between ion channels and one of the main driving forces for cancer development, the vint beta catenin pathway. Vint proteins are secreted lipid-modified glycoproteins that allow for communication between cells. Vint signaling is an evolutionary conversed regulatory pathway that governs numerous normal cellular and developmental processes such as cell fate determination, cell proliferation and migration. However, an abnormal Vint signaling has also been identified as a key mechanism in cancer biology. You may have noticed that the red box on the first hallmark of cancer includes a calcium activated potassium channel. This channel is not activated by Vint directly, but will be activated by intracellular calcium release caused by the Vint signaling pathway. Here you see a phylogenetic tree of mouse Vint genes. Vint signaling in ion channels has been the focus of a co collaboration between King's College London and Sophia and Bioscience. And the data will be presented shortly by Professor Amir Ahmed. Two variants of the Vint family that I have highlighted are the Vint subtypes types 5A and 9B that I have tested in the study with Professor Amir Ahmed. And he will take over the presentation from here. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you, Damien, for um, uh, inviting me to the seminar. And of course, thanks to Sofian. Um, I would just, I don't have any shares in Sofian, but, um, but to those who are not, um, uh, aware of the company is one of the best industrial partners I've come across in my scientific career and I encourage everyone to contact them about their products um, which are absolutely excellent and I would just um, start sharing my screen and see Okay, uh, Damien, could you tell me if you can see the screen? Excellent. Okay, so what I've just described is, so there are two ways of looking at um, ion channels in cancer. Uh, and I'll just move it a little bit. Um, one is that one can look for single ion channel uh, um, mutation. I mean, I, I think you need to click on uh, a different uh, uh, tab on your in your, the, your view here, so we can't really see your presentation. But you're more like okay. Yeah. Just one 
So I'm sharing my screen. It says it's fine. Yeah, we can see your um, screen, but we can see the demo screen here, like a replica of the one we are looking at. I see. Um, what about um, now? Not quite yet. Not yet, Amir. Um, yeah, so at the moment we just see your demo screen. So you should be able to go into the applications and and find the um, the application screen that might be giving you your PowerPoint presentation screen. Uh, yeah. Wait. So it tells me that I'm sharing my screen and your entire screen share. Yeah. Okay, just one second. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's good. Perfect. Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, after all that practice yesterday. Uh, so there are two ways of looking at iron channels in cancer. Uh, the theme of the seminar series is iron channels in cancer. And the this, this sub-theme is um, automated patch lamp in um, academia. So I'll try and cover both these. Um, topics. So now I just describe a large amount of data that is available um, to study how ion channels are involved in cancer at many stages. We take a slightly different approach. Uh, rather than looking at individual ion channels, our approach is to look at key signaling networks in cancer and see how they may be regulated by ion channels. So it, provides you a little bit of a global control over gene transcription, which naturally occurs uh, by um, signaling networks such as wind signaling. So just two other things. So uh, I'm at King's College London and my research is largely supported by a small charity called Prostate Cancer Research. Um, so wingless integration side. So WIND stands for wingless integration side. On the left of the screen, you can see um, Drosophila, where when WIND gene was mutated about um, in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, the phenotype appeared, uh, as you can see in a figure B, uh, as appeared without wings. Harold Barmus's group in mid 80s, I think, discovered that uh, they found a mouse memory tumor virus gene, which they called integration site one, and then discovered that it was a homologue of the Drosophila wingless gene. So the name at that point was combined to make WIND, wingless and integration site. There has been a vast amount of literature available on the function, genetics, and molecular uh, activation of wind signaling pathway. And one thing that is um, people have come to realize uh, that if it's not so much, cancer is not so much a disease of a single gene mutation as, as we all know, um, it's really how different, how cells interact with their environment and how different signaling pathways could be um, dysregulated. And this dysregulation of uh, developmental processes uh, is what eventually causes diseases like cancer. And uh, some time ago, it was also suggested that if one can control or regulate wind signaling, um, that could be beneficial, particularly for proliferative diseases like cancer. So we work on largely on prostate cancer, but other epithelial cancers as well. And a few of those are shown here. And what we normally find is, so we're looking at about four proteins which are related to wind signaling pathway in normal and cancer tissue. And invariably in cancer, it's um, highly dysregulated. Um, I can't point, but if you look at the middle of the screen, there are two cores. One is a nice intestinal villus looking down. Uh, it's taken from the same patient and the core right under it is um, a cancer core uh, from the same patient and there is a vast amount of overexpression of wind proteins, for example, in that cancer. And as Naya described, there's a large number of these wind proteins, about 19 have been identified. 
All right. And initially they were segregated into canonical and non-canonical pathways. Um, this becomes uh, germane later in the talk and I'll go through that. So in addition to secreted lichens, uh, there are about 26 receptors and co-receptors in different systems, uh, mammalian and Drosophila and other um, as said, it's an evolutionary conserve pathway. So uh, there are multiple receptors. And the reason for that, this evolutionary redundancy, is that it's in, wind signaling is involved in a large number of cellular processes from development to adulthood, and then uh, also in, in, in causing diseases, uh, proliferative diseases such as cancer. So slightly complicated graph, but uh, what you're looking at, uh, I don't have a pointer, I'm afraid. So what you're looking at is the outside of the cell, inside of the cell and the nucleus at the bottom and wind binds to its receptor. And initially there were two pathways. So one is the calcium pathway where it was thought that wind activates calcium release independently of beta catenin and the other transducer is beta catenin, which is a um, transcription factor co-activator and is involved in transcription of many diseases once it's inside the nucleus. And that journey is kind of important and critical. And I'll take you through that in a second. So once beta catenin is inside the cell uh, nucleus, it can activate transcription of a large number of genes, including many proto-oncogenes, such as CMIC, JUN, uh, cycling D1, etc. It's, that's why its role in all kinds of developmental and um, cellular function, uh, including stem cell self-renewal, is uh, important. So when we started, so I, I would like to give my first shout out to my good colleague, um, Chris Trisavalu. So we were interested in, um, we found in prostate cancer that wind signaling genes are hypomethylated and we needed to do one experiment which was uh, to look at calcium release and and we were looking at these things in mammalian cancer cells so when we started the idea was that you have a canonical and non-canonical pathway and uh, never the twain shall meet so we proposed after uh, experimentation um, a convergent model of wind signaling and the convergent model, uh, you'll see this uh, picture quite a lot, so I'll just explain what the elements of this picture are. So at the top you have the pink sort of um, jelly bean which is uh, which represents wind ligands um, and then you have these purple receptors and co-receptor frizzled and LRP5 and 6. Uh, the blue items are connects in 43, it will become apparent why it's uh, useful. Uh, the orange stuff is beta catenin. In Under normal circumstances, when wind signaling is inactive, uh, beta catenin is ubiquitinated and then it is destroyed in the proteasome uh, 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 after phosphorylation. Now, a couple of interesting things about beta catenin which got me very interested in it. Uh, it's a very large protein. It's about 92 kilodalton. It's supposed to activate, the, the, the fact that it activates gene transcription is not contested at all. It does enter the nucleus, but it doesn't have a nuclear localization signal. It has no RAN GTPase activity. And as, as you all know, nucleus has a, a, a sort of a multi two layer uh, envelope. It doesn't allow everything to go in. The upper limit for proteins to get through is about eight kilodalton. And lastly, beta catenin at cytosolic pH is highly negatively charged. And you also know uh, that nucleus, because it's full of DNA, is highly negatively charged. And there's a, a comment by uh, someone which suggests that nucleus basically acts like a negatively charged sink. So that's beta catenin. The brown stuff is nucleus. 
the yellow banana type stuff is uh, uh, represents endoplasmic reticulum uh, and bound calcium within it. Uh, the gray is the cell membrane, of course. And because wind uh, activates cam kinase uh, indirectly as well, cam kinase is represented at the bottom, in the bottom right as green. So this is our model. Uh, when wind is inactive, beta catenin is ubiquitin in it, phosphorylated, and is uh, destroyed in the proteasome. Uh, proteasome is on the top left of the screen. Uh, when wind binds, both connexin 43 and beta catenin, and we think connexin 43 chaperones beta catenin into the nucleus, are released. Just before that, calcium, uh, intracellular calcium store release calcium. Calcium freely enters into the nucleus in uh, large quantities. We think that it is likely to depolarize the nuclear electrical potential, which will provide an electrical pull for beta catenin, which is a large protein to actually get in. It binds with its uh, uh, transcription factor targets and gene transcription is initiated. So what is the evidence for this? Just before I go on, so we use a large number of cell lines, both cancer and primary cell lines. We have done a lot of these experiments in all of these cell lines. Uh, we do immunohistochemical, confocal microscopy, electron microscopy, uh, but the data I'm going to show you is largely live ratiometric calcium imaging and immunocytochemistry to suggest that in mammalian cell, uh, both canonical and non-canonical pathways uh, act in sync. So first evidence is uh, in these PC3 cells, but um, the same uh, can be found in many, many, many other cell types. So what we've got on the top left is control cells. You can see red is beta catenin in the membrane and uh, cytosol when there's no wind activation. The blue is uh, the nucleus, uh, which is stained with DAPI. When we add any of the winds, whether they are hard to be canonical or non-canonical uh, wind ligands, um, beta catenin can be seen to translocate into the nucleus. We've done this experiment many times with many different techniques with the same outcome, uh, adding wind protein uh, to the outside of the cell activates wind beta catenin translocation if, uh, or stabilization and beta catenin then enters into the nucleus. And this could be detected in a relatively short time of minutes. Um, the reason we think, uh, 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 although I'm not going to uh, say very much about this, uh, but we have also discovered that it's not just beta catenin which is stabilized and translocated into the nucleus. Connexin 43 is um, also a target for beta catenin, wind induced um, nuclear translocation. And again, these experiments were done immunocytochemically, Western blots, and electron microscopy. But um, here, CTNNB1 is uh, the name, gene name for beta catenin, and beta catenin is the protein. In red, uh, connexin 43 is detected as a green signal. And you can see that when you add WIN5A or WIN9B, uh, both of these proteins are translocated into the nucleus almost uh, simultaneously. Uh, we knock down beta catenin um, at the middle. Uh, panel is for scrambled uh, control um, uh, siRNA uh, and connect uh, beta catenin is when we knock beta catenin out what appears to happen is that connexin becomes loose inside it almost becomes stabilized on its own without any wind signal so there's a lot of uh, uh, data that we substantiated this idea with to suggest that both beta catenin and connexin 43 are targets of uh, wind translocation. And we think that connexin 43 may act as a chaperone protein because beta catenin itself doesn't have a nuclear localization signal. The next piece of evidence is using live ratiometric calcium imaging. On the left of the screen, you'll see cells which are loaded with FLU4. On the, uh, the cells are loaded with FLU4 and furoret. 
splitting the channel will show you the same picture with one green and one red. And I'll run this. Uh, and at some point, we add wind in, as a bolus in the corner of the dish. And what you see is um, flu 4, which detects free calcium. Its signal is uh, increased and fear red simultaneously decreases, indicating that wind activates intracellular calcium stores. And again, a, a large number of experiments were done to show that it's store operated calcium release. So this experiment, uh, and then we just sort of, it's a medium throughput analysis. Uh, we look at a, a, a 20X, um, get about 50 or 60 cell. Uh, we made a little widget uh, to, calculate the ratio of flu four and flu red, and this is what is represented here. But this is uh, the result. Whether it's a canonical wind lighten, such as 3A, 4, 9B, or 10B, or wind 5A, which is a classical, originally non-canonical lichen, they all activate calcium release. Uh, the only one we found which doesn't is wind 11. So we tested almost all commercially available winds uh, in this way, and we found all of those activate both calcium release and catena translocation. And then we did uh, an experiment, which I'm not very proud of, but it, it was um, sort of a trailblazer for what occurred later. Uh, in the same cells, uh, we use FM4 nominally as a membrane potential dye. And to test the system, we just uh, added external, increased external potassium concentration. And we could see that the cell membrane uh, potential could be detected to be increased. And the same happened um, for the nuclear membrane. And we repeated this experiment with wind and FM4. So in, the, in this picture, we are looking at uh, wind-induced calcium release and in the cytosol and the nucleus. And we are detecting, instead of uh, fewer red, we have FM4, which appears as roughly as a brownish dye. And if you uh, look carefully, you could see that both in the nucleus and in the cell membrane, the FM4 signal is actually increased. And that's represented in the graph at the bottom. This indicated that maybe wind is doing something. So the, the idea was that you know, wind induces calcium release. Calcium will do something to the cell membrane potential uh, by activating a K calcium channel. So that seems to be borne out. And we, in a sort of a classical biochemical um, bioelectrophysiological experiment, uh, one changes the potassium concentration and see uh, what happens to the intracellular calcium release and increasing the, uh, decreasing the potassium gradient uh, almost abolished uh, the wind induced calcium release. So these were hints uh, and allegations about um, the role of wind in um, that it could be relate, it may be doing something, or it may be electrogenic, and it may be sort of related to the changes in the cell membrane potential. So these were the questions that arose at the time. And um, so the first thing was, it, it, is wind signaling uh, regulated by electrical, cell electrical potential? We knew that calcium is increased, so we could. We thought maybe we could use um, K calcium activity as a fast readout for early wind signal activation. Now, as you have seen before in the, in the previous slides, and what other people had done, uh, mostly using genetic approaches to characterize the function of wind signaling, or when you use live calcium imaging, or beta-catena stabilization and translocation, that takes minutes to hours. So, so this is so, sort of a time-consuming assay. So if you wanted to look at receptor binding quickly, maybe this could be a surrogate readout. 
And then the sort of the niggling question was, is it possible that these proteins could act as ligands for ion channels or transporters? So as I said, all assays previously um, had sort of utilized time scales which are well in excess of minutes to hours. So if you're looking at sort of fine functions of these uh, cellular functions, um, you're looking at things that happened some time ago before you could detect them. So, and here is, um, you don't know what fate tells you. So about this time, uh, I practically abandoned the sort of the ruminant electrophysiology that I'd learned uh, uh, in my time at Dundee and Yale and had pretty much become um, uh, involved very much in prostate cancer and went signaling. So the outcome was that I had dismantled my rig and uh, given away bits and pieces to various people. And then we arrived at this about five, six years ago, and there was no way to go. So the next set of data that I'm going to present, um, and here I have to give a shout out to uh, an old colleague at Sophie and Herbor, who in addition with Naya has been absolutely brilliant for describing quite a lot of these things, and uh, my esteemed colleague, uh, Professor Jonathan Ashmore, whose help, with, without whose help, I don't think quite a lot of what I'm about to present would have uh, materialized. So this data was recently published in Journal of Physiology, and there were two reasons to seek out other people. As I mentioned, I didn't have a rig anymore. Uh, so one lesson is, uh, Try and store it in, a, in your garage. If you don't use it, it might come in handy at some point. Um, and the other issue was that we're dealing with a very large family of proteins. So if you went with wind 5A, uh, the reviewer will say, well, you know, what happens with other winds? And if you went with uh, wind 5A and 9B, they'll say, well, you know, what about 7A and 10B and so on and so forth. So I contacted, um, Sofian, who were very kind to suggest that we could do a collaboration. And the purpose was that if I were to do this experiment, even if I had a rig, uh, testing 19 ligands or at least five or six of them um, would have taken a lifetime, as most people who are electrophysiologists know. Um, uh, if you get four cells a day, that's a pretty good day. Uh, but, and uh, the other thing is that when you're dealing with cancer cell lines, we are very careful in doing all the experiments in at least three or four different cell lines so that we don't end up in this uh, morass that maybe it's just a cell line effect that we are seeing. So if you multiply the number of cells and the number of lichens, that becomes a very tricky task if you're doing electrophysiology. So thankfully, I got in touch with Sophie and we were able to do these experiments on this fantastic machine, which is QPASH2. Um, so what I would have, uh, if I would taken one wind and one cell line and spent about three or four months doing it, uh, Naya could do all that in about 25 minutes and in 48 cells. So that's how some of these experiments were done. So QPASH allows you to do a large number of cells simultaneously. One excellent advantage of this system uh, from a classical sort of single micropipette electrophysiology point of view is that the bath volume is very small and the rapid mixing in the Q patch due to its microfluidic channels is extremely rapid. So if you're interested in fast events, this is absolutely essential. Uh, a, a one mil or a 0.5 mil bath that we are used to using is not quite good enough uh, uh, if you're using particularly gravity as a, uh, to mix the bath with your drugs or uh, compound. And the reason I actually uh, went to QPAS because I'd read that this is one of the few, at the, or the only one at the time, and I, I don't know whether there are any at the moment, which allowed you to have gigasenes. Most other automated patch lamp systems don't, didn't used to have that. 
And one other thing that we discovered is its ability to uh, record capacitance continuously. So we took a few wins. Um, now I only mentioned two, but we've tested three or four uh, now. And uh, 5A, 9B, and 10B is the data I'm going to present to you. Uh, by the way, they also have a monster which does 384 cells. So that's about a po two years post op worth in a, in a plate. So Naya and Herbor initially were able to run some of these experiments. And uh, uh, th these are sort of um, current plots which are uh, measured at 100 millivolts in PC3 cells. And uh, various things are happening. But in the, in the third column, uh, the, the second big column, you see that winds are added and you get an a increase in output current at 100 millivolts. And I'm showing you a mixture of wind 5A, 9B, and 10B data. So you can get a large number of uh, highly reproducible data relatively quickly. You can construct IT IV plots out of it, and uh, we always see an output rectification and in, uh, increase in leak currents, as you will see uh, when we validate these. So this was pretty straightforward, and we now knew that adding winds can activate currents in at least PC3 cells. And as I mentioned, um, the continuous capacitance measurement is also very useful tool um, and it's kind of very interesting i'm not going to go into any detail because we don't really have a lot of data for this but um you can see that different winds may have a slightly different effect on cell capacitance indicating uh, uh, functions such as um, endocytosis or cell volume changes that might be occurring due to wind activation so this is a summary of the data that we Publish uh, the gray bar in the top panel suggests where the winds, uh, when the winds are added. When you add wind, there's an increase in output current at 100 millivolt. The profile of the current is slightly different for different wind proteins. Um, uh, Jonathan uh, made a little widget to calculate the zero crossing potential. Um, it's the current at zero crossing of the IV curve. It's basically a representative of instantaneous membrane potential. Um, and you can see that it's slightly hyperpolarized whenever winds are added and then recovers when you remove the winds. So we were, at least the first question was answered. The other interesting things that are very useful is, and I'm just showing you one example, but we've done quite a few of these now, that you could do a large number of concentrations at the same time, which allows for the robustness of the data. So you're not doing one cell today with one concentration, another cell tomorrow with another concentration. Either the cells have um, sort of gone down a little bit or, it, or the protein is degrading. So this, this was very, very uh, useful when we were using QPASH to characterize wind-induced currents. But of course, before we could publish, we, we were sort of conventional people so we wanted we had the same kind of um, um we had the same kind of reservations about anything automated um people of a certain vintage do um so at this point uh i got in touch with jonathan and uh with his determination and effort we were able to do a little bit of work on what we, I call conventional single patch, uh, which is not quite the right term, but single micropipette electrophysiology. Here we are, I'm just showing you the data from multiple different cell types. And what you see is the slope conductance is actually um, increased whenever winds are added. And interestingly, the zero crossing potential uh, doesn't change very much. And that is kind of important uh, because that suggests that uh, there's no involvement of uh, voltage-gated calcium channels, and that becomes pertinent later on. 
And what Jonathan was also able to uh, do is to rig this system up. So here, we, I'm, in this picture, what you're seeing is a, a, a cell which is being patched, and then a, a puffer pipette is brought quite near it. And the reason for this was this data was accumulated when we add WIMPs as a bolus, as we were doing for live calcium imaging due to the restrictions of the technique and the microscope and so on. And as you know, uh, especially for a protein, the mixing in, the, in, in, in volume can, can cause a little bit of delay in activation. And then the time kinetics become quite different. So what we were able to see very quickly, as soon as wind arrives, there is an increase in current. Uh, there is a time delay when you're doing the live calcium imaging experiment. So this was rigged to basically do two things. One is to see, to have the wind concentrations calibrated because we are adding winds with mixing wind with Alexa 647, which is a red dial. And we can measure the calcium release and currents simultaneously. So this was all done at the Air Institute uh, at UCL where Jonathan is. Um, and this is a current lamp looking at eight millisecond line scans, looking at intracellular calcium release, Alexa arrival, and membrane potential changes simultaneously. And the puffer pipette is um, operated by a pressure pulse. Uh, so in figure A, you see the sort of the line scan and, 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 and time. And what you also see in C, D, and E, so C is the cell membrane potential. Uh, the dotted line tells you when Alexa arrives at the cell. It's a very precise measurement. There is a slight depolarization while there is a slight decrease in intracellular calcium. As wind concentration increases, and we consider that the localized concentration here rises from zero to about 30 nanomolar, which is very difficult to sort of uh, uh, calibrate when you're doing bolus injections in static or even superfusing bars. So there's a, there's a deep, slight depolarization simultaneously as calcium is decreasing. That depolarization then, and then the cell hyperpolarizes as the calcium rises. So three possibilities were suggested that either this, the decrease, initial decrease in calcium, this short latency here before the calcium rises, uh, could be because the calcium is being buffered, calcium is extruded from the cell, or there's a small influx of calcium, uh, which exist in these cells because they have a very, uh, so they have a very uh, low, deep, slightly depolarized resting potential. So any small change in potassium channel could actually hyperpolarize these very, very quickly. And so calcium buffering and calcium equilibrium is critical for maintenance of cell membrane potential in these cells. And the same experiment using uh, current clamp uh, on its own shows you the small latency, the initial depolarization, hyperpolarization. Now, when we remove the calcium from outside, that that phenomenon still exists. So external calcium or cal voltage-gated calcium channels were not at play here. And that short latency suggests that there is going to be uh, involvement of ion channel because only ion channels that sort of operate in that time scale of milliseconds to a second. So we knew that um, these PC3 cells and these other cells that we've been looking at uh, express trip channels in addition to K-calcium channels. And so the first few experiments were just to characterize the sort of trip channels in these cells. So isolin is an um, agonist. When you add isolin, there is a small inward current in these cells. Um, on the right-hand side of the picture, 
you see a current clam cell in which we are adding menthol, which is also a, an agonist of um, uh, trip channels. And when you add the first, so one, two, three are three different puffs of menthol that were added to it. And you see a very similar profile of first initial depolarization and hyperpolarization of a cell membrane potential. Then we used uh, BCTC, which is supposedly a, a specific inhibitor of TRIP-M8, but it does inhibit some of the TRIP-B1 channels as well in the literature. And that abolished the initial oscillating wind current. So that suggested the involvement of TRIPs in wind activation. So we came up with this model. Uh, it's slightly complicated. It's not completely um, uh, uh, foolproof at the moment, but the idea here is that wind binds to uh, its receptor and co-receptor, but also activates uh, a trip channel. This trip channel is a, acts as a non-selective cation channel. It can extrude, it can, Per, calcium is permeable through it in both directions. And um, what initially happens is there is a small influx of calcium through this channel, and that actually causes a change in calcium equilibrium. Monovalent cations can also pass through this channel. And it's the balance of this which initially allows a small amount of calcium to get in. So we see the depolarization. And then calcium from near uh, the ER goes out. That is the signal for the calcium stores to release calcium. That calcium then activates the BK-alpha or KCN and 4 uh, potassium channels. Calcium goes into the nucleus and uh, beta catenin and so on. So we're not showing beta catenin and, and other elements here, but that is uh, uh, given. So we think that a combination of um, automated patch lamp validated by single cell micropipette patching, in addition to some sophisticated uh, mechanistic uh, approaches using both current measurement and live calcium measurement simultaneously have allowed us to sort of describe a new mechanism for a, a, a very important signaling pathway which whose role in cal cancer is uh, indisputable. And the next question was, can we actually inhibit uh, the electrical activity of wind signaling and then inhibit everything else that happens downstream, which is the calcium release and transcriptional sta activation, stabilization of beta catenin and inhibiting transcription because the signal at the cell membrane has been inhibited. Now, this is important because most of the drugs that were designed for wind signaling were designed for kinases that act downstream of the cell membrane in the cytosol. And one of the problems, as most people who work in uh, drug development will tell you, I think, is that designing an excellent kinase inhibitor is good, but getting it inside the cell membrane is not as straightforward as one would like to think. Hence the cytotoxic effects that you see uh, for many of these. So if you can control these signaling pathways right at the cell membrane, which is not likely to be possible for uh, signaling networks which are evolutionary critical and have a huge amount of redundancy built into them. Regulate, inhibiting them by drugs which inhibit ion channels. And uh, people who also work in drug development know that a large number of drugs in current clinical use are ion channel or ion transport or inhibitors. So there is already a sort of a pathway to connect the big signaling networks if they are regulated by cell membrane potential to develop drugs. So that's the last part of my talk. I'm not going to uh, spend very much time on it, but we call these things membrane potential regulating compound because they don't just belong to one class of drugs. Our approach here is that we are going to test 50 MPRCs 
membrane potential regulating compound which may inhibit uh, wind current. We'll test that in QPatch. In fact, Naya has been uh, fantastic and has done quite a lot of these experiments already. The idea is that we will do an electropharmacological approach in which we will use multiple wind ligands because they may be different in different cancers, uh, multiple wind concentration with and without MPRCs um, and calculate IC50s that way. Uh, so, you know, just this little experiment uh, is running into 500 cells already. The next is slightly low throughput, which is to say that we'll select 15 of these MPRCs and test for downstream effects of wind signaling, both live calcium imaging and control uh, and inhibition of uh, beta catenin stabilization and translocation. Integrating the calcium and IC50 data, we then take five of these MPRCs into mouse models and see which are the best inhibitors for, and we've already got um, some headway in trying to do some trials in feline cancer and also in human penile cancer, which is an epithelial cancer as well. And eventually the idea is to take three MPRCs for prospective clinical trials. So it's a sort of an inverted pyramid approach for drug repurposing. Uh, so again, QPAT is great for that because we can screen a large number of compounds, get a very good idea about their native activity on the cells that of interest and also um, on different winds. We have, we've got a few of these things uh, um, which look quite interesting. Um, and uh, we've published a couple of papers around uh, the basic uh, background characterization of the compounds of interest. Uh, these are generally drugs uh, uh, which are already in clinical use. Uh, and we see that they can inhibit wind currents. We've got some idea that some of these also inhibit wind induced calcium release and also so we are reasonably uh, excited about making MPRCs as repurposed drug to try and see if it could work as cancer therapy. So thank you very much for your attention. Two people, uh, three people in addition to Naya you've already seen, Jonathan Ashmore, Chris Rosablu and Herbor, who used to be at SOFA and, uh, and left recently. Uh, a couple of other students who work very uh, on these some of these projects, and Mike Miller in Edinburgh, who is an excellent uh, immunocytochemistry chap who does most of our tissue array and, uh, and cell uh, staining. So I'll leave you with this. This is our model for. Um, the current model for wind signaling, which includes the data that I've presented. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Fantastic, really fascinating talk. I have got hundreds of questions alone, and I'm tempted to abuse my vast power as host just to pepper you with my questions. However, I realize that would be an abuse of power. Uh, maybe I can do that offline. Um, so I've got a few questions here for you already. Um, and by all means, if, if people have extra questions while we're answering these, get typing and get them into the chat box. Um, so Guy Salaman was, Salamar was asking, how quick are the changes in internal calcium induced by wind? Uh, excellent. So this gives me a little opportunity for, to make a point that I missed. So. I see wind activation as a tail of three timelines. Um, first one is uh, the ion channel. Let me stop sharing this. Uh, okay. um, so first one is the very fast wind interaction with um, its ion channel target. It could be trip, one of the trips. Then you have uh, the transmission of the transduction of that signal, either through increase the, the, the calcium equilibrium that, that we think is happening, or through the phospholipase C and other enzymatic reactions, 
So now you're talking about from milliseconds to seconds. Uh, so calcium release starts occurring as soon as, roughly as soon as wind arrives, but it takes about 10 second delay uh, in bolus injections, but it does happen relatively quickly, but millisecond to seconds. And then the beta catenian translocation, which takes, we can detect it within two minutes, but you can imagine that it's not activating a signal and then inhibiting it in a dish by putting it on coal or something takes. So within five minutes, we are able to detect beta catenian signal. So calcium is released within seconds, hundreds of seconds, uh, to reach the peak. And then it stays, at least in the nucleus, for quite some time. As you may have noticed, there were some time stamps on the one of the figures that I showed. So it's about 200 seconds that calcium is starts to reach its peak. And then there will be this whole mechanism within the cell to re-sequester calcium because it can't have calcium floating about. So um, I, 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 I hope that answers your uh, query. And, and I'll just step in because that gives me a nice excuse to ask one of my many questions. So this this obvious speed of activity potentially against directly against an iron channel suggests that it is potentially a direct modulation of the, the wind pro, uh, protein upon the, the iron channel. Do you have any ideas or even potential data on maybe where on the iron channel it may be affecting these modulations? Did you? So, Damien, you you must have done some alanine scanning mutagenesis in your time. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> so it requires somebody like you <laughs> to do some alanine scanning mutagenesis on the wind protein. Mm -hmm. um, I'm getting quite old, so I'm not entirely sure whether I'll be able to. I, I know things have moved on, and. Uh, you know, you could isolate things very quickly, mutate them even quicker. But now that remains to be seen. Um, it's a big protein, you know, 42 kilo Dalton. Uh, all you need is a couple of amino acid in a specific conformation to activate the channel. Uh, so the trip M8, I think one of the trip, I think trip M8 crystal structure is known. So one can do some modeling or at least inform modeling to identify that. But we are sort of, uh, kind of stuck with uh, taking, you know, uh, trying to find cure for cancer kind of thing. So, so that that remains to be done. Yeah, leave that kind of donkey work to fools like me. I'll get onto it eventually. Um, so, right. so Julio Alvarez asks, could you combine? Oh, sorry, um, I've just lost that one actually. Yes, Julio Alvarez was asking, have you tested other trip channel agonists? such as capsaicin, mustard, or cinnamaldehyde? Naya should be able to answer that because she has. And we have investigated some of these. Uh, but, you know, one of the things, so the good thing is that you could do quite a lot very quickly. And I think the downside is that when all this data is thrown at you for 50 drugs at 20 different concentrations, for a uh, daughters like me, it takes a little bit of time to go through that. But we have gone through quite a lot of uh, uh, compounds to um, to see. And yes, it is on our list. Okay, a, a second question from Julio Alvarez. Could you combine patch clamp data with turf TIRF microscopy to assess EFIS and wind activated beta catenin translocation? Uh, yes, you can. And if you could um, write a little comment for my uh, uh, good colleagues, Jonathan and Christopher, um, Trisavalu, who has just left, I can see, um, uh, it, they might be able to sort of uh, get this going. But I don't think there's, the, the one problem is that, I mean, although we sort of keep these cells for about 20 minutes at a time, uh, one of the things that you notice when you're adding, so one point I would just make before I complete the other point. What we are doing, we are using winds at very, very low concentrations. And um, this is something that you won't find in many of the papers that use wind as a ligand outside the cell. 
So we are very sure that we are within the physiological range for wind activation. One thing that we see uh, with, when we add winds is that it does have a severe effect on single cells if we leave them for a very long time. So the stability is an issue, but it, one can um, sort of tag the beta catenin and then follow its translocation. Because it happens within five minutes, we might just be able to see it, but really uh, I would need uh, uh, Jonathan to um, Jonathan to and Christopher to sort of do this. Okay, so we've got three questions and I'll try and put them to you in as simple a format as I can from Guy Salama. Um, so Amir, great talk with very intriguing data. So first question, can we get a PDF of your JFIS paper? Second question, what is the function of the small wind, de uh, wind dependent depolarization? And third question, uh, can one compare the structures of different winds to speculate on what part of the wind molecules interact with trips? Do you need me to go over any of those or? Have you yes, uh, so l let, me, um, let me just uh, take one question at a time. So take the last one first. So we published a paper in 2013 on, and, and the back of it is I think that only, although wind has been studied for a very long time, but if you look at the primary structure, protein structure, um, I can't show you, but I, I, can, I can put down, it's the Thrasavlu et al, and you can have a look at the, it's a JBC 2013 paper. And uh, that has a sequence. Uh, uh, so I did a little bit of sequence analysis at that time. And like most proteins, the conservation is in these motifs. So R, W, N, C, if I remember correctly. So one, but they are big proteins. And, you know, the N terminal and C terminal are very, very different, different uh, homologs in diff for, for different uh, um, even within uh, different species. So ideally one would like to know um, how the protein is folded and what is actually binding. But we haven't gone that path, that sort of a words in territory at the moment, even for the frizzle receptors actually. The second question. Sorry, what was the second yeah, question? Yeah, the second question that I sort of whizzed through was, what is the function of the small wind dependent depolarization? Right. So I think one of the things, so activation of trip, and if I send you uh, the, the it's, a, it's a slightly long and convoluted um, explanation, and um, there's even uh, uh, an appendix that we had to add to our JFS paper to explain that. So I can send you that and you'll find, so the initial depolarization we think is calcium equilibrium before, uh, and it could be one of the signals for store activation. Okay. Um, we're almost coming to the end of the, the questions at least, which means that if you're willing to stay on, I've got one more which will probably be one of those really annoying ones, almost a bit like I asked about, do you want to do a massive alanine scan and then present the data in a decade's time? Um, but along those lines, and just adding a headache to your already uh, large number of experiments, have you, um, and you may not have done this yet, but have you considered the possibility of doing combinations of WINTs and the potential for synergistic effects between certain combinations so this your question gives me an opportunity to uh, sing praises of one other element of QPAS, which is great so winds are expensive so you know 10 micrograms is about 400 pounds uh, when we're using bolus we are using um, sort of a microliter, two microliter of 100 nanograms per microliter concentration. So the one thing that we, we certainly can do this experiment, but it'll have to be done on QPATCH because in QPATCH you have a very small 
bath volume because of the microfluidics. And when we do these sort of bolus experiments, these take, uh, you know, half a bottle of wind to do one set of experiments. Naya can do the same thing and run about 10, 48 well plates for the same amount of wind. So I think they'll have to be done there, especially the synergistic one, but you do end up with some difficulty um, about dissecting which one, because then you'll have to mutate the other one as a control to see what contribution it is. Is it an additive or a cumulative effect of one or the other? That, that'll be your fans calling in to, uh, to make sure everything's gone okay. I think they, they are not my fans at all, but uh, um, yes. But, but that's pretty much it. So I'd, lo I'd love to thank you for your time and your effort in putting together such a great talk. Similarly, Naya, I thought that was a brilliant introduction that you gave at the start. And obviously a lot of your work was uh, part of this collaborative um, uh, data that you've generated with Professor Ahmed. So yeah, thank you both. Really great talk. Um, we've had some really good questions, I think, too. And I think me and you need to sort of spend some time post-COVID in a pub to really sort the world to rights, uh, I'm here because there's a lot of things here that I, I think um, we can work together on. Uh, so let, let's do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if anybody's, um, anybody's from around London or in the vicinity, we are trying to put together uh, an application. Um, uh, we can, uh, if they're interested in using QPatch, we would be very interested in hearing from them. And of course, yeah, I mean, contact Professor Ahmed for, for those kind of things. Equally, if you don't have his um, contact details, we can pass them on or just try and come through, through Sophie and, We've all got our um, emails available. Um, I should have actually had that on the title slide for myself at least, but by all means, get in contact with us. There's plenty of ways to do that. And we can pass any uh, inquiries on to Professor Ahmed too. Um, but I'm sure you can get hold of him through uh, the King's College website as well. But thanks to everyone. That was a really great set of talks. And uh, thanks for everyone who attended too for your time as well. And with that- we'll Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Damien. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your attention. Take care. Very kind. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye.